I've played through Shining Force Gaiden or Shining Force CD Book 1, whatever you want to call it, because you have no time to game. It seemed fate that the Takahashi brothers and the Camelot staff would end up working on a Shining Force game for the Game Gear, as that was one of the early possibilities of the original Shining Force. And this is what happened with Shining Force Gaiden, and its sequel, Shining Force Gaiden 2, or as we know it in the West, Shining Force the Sword of Hazard, like Shining Force Gaiden 2. But there is a better way to play them, other than trying to read Japanese on the Game Gear, and that's Shining Force CD collection for the Sega Mega CD, the updated, remade version of both the games with two extra scenarios, all redone using the Shining Force 2 engine as opposed to the neutered Game Gear's variants. So it's kind of a bit of a weird history there. So Shining Force Gaiden, as far as I can tell, has never been translated into English. So I couldn't actually play that version, like the Game Gear version, like I originally intended to. But I still want to do these kind of in the order of releases of the games. So I know Shining Force CD came out later, but since Shining Force Gaiden came out after Shining Force, it still counts in my head. But yeah, I think basically because no one's ever bothered to translate the Game Gear version because the CD version exists. And honestly, it's the better way to play it from what I've seen anyway. Better graphics, better interface, everything. So yeah, I totally emulated the Mega CD version and it took me roughly eight hours to beat Shining Force like Gaiden. The game was once again, a collab between Sega and Camelot, or Software Sonic Planning as it was known at the time. The Japanese release on the 25th of December 1992 for the Game Gear, and the CD version coming out on the 21st of July 1994, so a couple of years later. The US version got the CD version in the 22nd of March 1995, and the EU had to wait until June of that year. But how does it play? So now if you've watched my Shining Force retrospective review, you'll have a good grasp on how it plays, with some minor differences around levelling and such. For those that didn't watch the Shining Force review, Gaiden is a top-down, turn-based strategy RPG. So you have an army of individuals that will, when it's their turn, as the game utilises speed-based turn order as opposed to the more standard I go, you go, as seen in a lot of other SRPGs. On the character's turn, they move a set number of squares, perform an action such as attack, magic, equip items, the usual standard affair. But again, the game uses the Camelot style box grid interface for a quick and easy use. Um, and yeah, it's pretty simple really. Like these, these aren't complicated SRPGs or strategy RPGs. Now, I said there's a bit of a difference between this and Shining Force. That comes in the area of leveling. As this game is a little less brutal using Shining Force 2 system as CD came out after Shining Force 2. The stats go up in a more steady manner than the previous title, and you don't suffer the brutal stat drop upon promotion as seen in Shining Force 1. This is very much for its benefit, as it helps the game flow a lot better. You're not suddenly stunted by promoting. I mean, the previous game is designed to help mitigate this a bit with the enemy types, etc. And you're not meant to promote your whole team in one go, but it's advisable to use the aggress technique to grind, and so on and so forth, and focus on a small number of characters. But in Gaiden on CD, you're not suffering as much, which means you don't necessarily need to stop and grind out levels to regain stats. Promotion actually feels good this time, <laughs> and it's a little easier to play around with more of the characters. What we are missing in this one, though, is the towns. And while in Shining Force, towns are a key element, something that sets them apart from the masses of other strategy games, the town in Shining Force brings it back in line with the standard JRPG formula, well, not even JRPG, just RPGs in general. A rule we've seen in early RPGs such as Wizardry or even tabletop games, where a town is the hub in which you start from and build a story, build a story world and lore, along with providing a place of rest from the battles, even for us players. The town breaks up the constant state of battle and allows our minds to rest. And in this game, sadly, this is relegated out of existence for a simple camp menu. And... This menu has all the functions of the town, minus the exploration, story building. And, you know, <laughs> this kind of defines the gameplay loop of Gaiden, bringing it in line with a lot of its contemporary SRPGs, where you battle, small story scene, and pill around in the camp before battling again. This is something you see in a lot of other SRPGs, where you battle, story scene, maybe a chance to sort your team out battle. 
as opposed to the Shining Force, and even Shining Force 2, which we haven't got to yet, loop of battle, story, explore, sort your army out, with the explore bit being important as for world development. But yeah, that's that's pretty much it with the gameplay. It's not complicated. It's not complicated. Shining Force games aren't complicated games. But how does the story go? This is obviously going to be total spoilers as we look through the whole game. So you've been warned. <laughs> uh, the game opens in the great land of Guardiana. Henri is now queen. She's from Shining Force 1. With many of the old Shining Force acting as a council. Another nation has sent their ambassador called Waldor. Well, being quite rude and murdering some of the guard, Anri tells everyone to stand down, and Waldor gifts her a present from the King of Cyprus, Edmund. Upon opening the box, she is enveloped in a black fog and descends into a deep sleep, the only cure to which can be provided by Cyprus, if they follow Waldor's commands. In response, Ken and Lowe, previous members of the Shining Force, send a Shining Force, a new one, to Cyprus to find the cure. After a month of no news, they believe that the worst has happened. But end of stage left, the new, true Shining Force. The kids of our previous generation of heroes. And a stranger called Nick, the true hero of this story, and kind of the max replacement for this game. The new force head out by boat for Cyprus. Oh god, a boat. And well, Shining Force plus boat equals shipwreck. This formula holds true. And once more an enemy appears on, on its dying death, explodes a massive hole in the boat, causing the group to crash on the island of Miniom. Mini Miniom. What a name. Arriving at the shore, Lo hears a scream, and the group, weaponless, head to battle once more, saving the girl and getting a shiny new monk in the process, as the girl was his sister. But we need a new boat. Is that really a good idea? But to get the boat, we have to go through the Miniom Bastion that Cyprus has captured. So arriving at the bastion, Cray, the monk, shows his worth, tricking the guards into lowering the drawbread, and we go in and wreck face. Getting through this creepy bastion, a birdman enters, saying he's a member of Cyprus Resistance, and has a ship for us. The boat, for once, actually works, and we arrive at Ashreet, just in time to see Cyprus forces looking for someone. So we attack, fighting our way into the town, arriving just in time to see the Cyprus guys, kill a guard, and discover a secret passage. Not well, it does them any good, as, well, we murder them. Out of the secret passage comes Stock and Mayfair, more members of the Rebellion. Mayfair, in particular, is a daughter of the Archbishop, who was slain by Waldon, and herself was blinded by him. But they join, and we've got, and we've got another healer. <laughs> this game gives you a lot of healers. We now have a target, Bazoo, one of Waldon's right hands. So off to his tower we go. Fighting our way up, we discover that Bazoo is actually looking for Nick, our glorious leader. And after running him off the top, we save a mage called Yisha, who drops the bomb that Nick is actually the Prince of Cyprus. The group get back on the boat and actually arrive at Cyprus lands. But King Edmund, Nick's uncle, arrives and spots Nick, so a fight breaks out. After the battle, Lowe is a bit concerned about Nick's allegiance until Gian, the Beastman, arrives, telling everyone that Nick left Cyprus specifically to save Guardiana, and is actually the rightful king of Cyprus. I'm going to stop here for a second. Nick is a classic, <laughs> sub, a, a classic RPG protagonist in that he's silent. So when Lowe is saying all this stuff, Nick just goes dot, 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 instead of using his voice. People, use your voice why you have it. Camping in an open field for the night? Well, it doesn't go as planned and the group is attacked once more. Clearing these lovely fellows, we enter a wonderful and pleasantly named Death Tunnel, where a ghoul mocks Nick, that is, the previous army that was sent has been killed, but a centaur shouts to watch out for the magic mushrooms. Lo recognises the centaur as Cashing, part of the original group, and we fight to save him. Rescuing him, it tells us that the old force has either been killed or taken prisoner. So we carry on to the fortress of Gundal, only to discover that Danton and Frabel, two more of Waldor's generals, are there waiting. Frabel sets up an anti-magic device, and they wander off back into the fortress. It's anti-magic device ain't stopping us. Get inside, we have to go face to face with Danton. He doesn't really want to fight Nick. Um, as it turns out, he used to serve the family quite loyally. Um, but Waldor has brainwashed Edmund, and Anne 
So Waldo's brainwashed Edmund, and Waldo actually worships Iom, an evil spirit. And Danton, just being loyal as he is, has to do as he's told. Danton passes after we kill him. And we get another Birdman, Shriek, who only survived because Danton spared him. What a good guy. In Cyprus proper now, we face Edmund in battle. And to his last, he curses Nick. But Randolph appears. He's a centaur. Consoles Nick, reminding him of the brainwashing. Finally, we get to head to Waldo's fortress. On the way, we face Geppel, the next of Waldo's generals. Defeating him, he informs us that Bazoo and Frabel won't be so easy to defeat, as Waldo has superpowered them using uh, Iom's power. As we enter, Waldo appears, saying that he's summoned Iom and sets his guard dogs on it. We crush Frabel and Bazoo, but Waldo has managed to actually summon Iom, but not well enough, so we actually have a chance to slay the creature. Uh, after slaying the creature, Waldo tries to retreat, but Lug, or I believe he was Luke in the first game, appears to stop him with the Sword of Hazia in hand. And this was what Waldo was actually after all along, it seems. So he turns himself into a bloody scorpion. Defeating him, finally, it's a bit bittersweet, as Nick's arm is turned to stone from the poison from Waldo. Amory wakes up and sends a force to go help Nick, thus ending Shining Force Gaiden. So, yeah, that was the story. <laughs> Literally, it doesn't take much explaining. So what was actually good about the game? Well, it's Shining Force, through and through. The battles are pretty much what makes up most of the game, and they're kind of, in a sense, a slight upgrade from Shining Force 1. They flow a bit better, and there are not as many of the, those types of maps. You know the ones, where you start half a mile away with a massive forest between you and the enemy slowing your movements. But yeah, it, it's that's about it really. Like it's it's a shining force game. It's competent. <laughs> now, there is only one thing I've really dumped in the negative category, and that's the removal of the towns. This I always felt was a key error of Shining Force. And with its removal it's just missing something. I mean the camp scenes suit its purpose, but that's about it. So overall my personal opinion is that it's a competent game a competent game and SRPG that didn't quite live up to the first one. But then again, it originally came out in Game Gear, so it didn't quite have the power behind it. But I think this would actually make quite a good first SRPG for someone. The plot is separate enough that you don't need to have played the first one. You'll miss out on a couple of references, but all, all sequels are the same. But yeah, it's, it's good. It's competent. The story isn't complex in any way, shape or form. So it's not going to rack your brain hurting it, especially if this is your first one. It's not the overly political multiple twists that many of the other SRPGs have. So yeah, it's not a bad game at all. It's just not as good as Shining Force. Now, if you've seen any of my other reviews, you know I follow a rating scale of must play, give it a go, probably for niche gamers, best to avoid. And Shining Force for me is a must play, but this is give it a go.